Hello world, my name is Atticus and welcome back to the experiment. It's the last day of the year, so it's time we took a look back and rank works of art that are fundamentally incomparable. Starting us off at 10th place is a game that by most metrics would probably place much higher. Unfortunately for this title, we are judging it on the whole, and in the parts that matter the most to me, this title falls short. Now, before I say what it is, as a quick in before, I would like to remind you that last year's top 10 list featured only 9 games, because there were only 9 games that I had played which merited being in the top 10. Making this list, even in last place, is nothing but praise, even when I'm explaining why a title isn't higher. That out of the way, this year's 10th best game is The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. This game does so many things so incredibly and sometimes impossibly well. The physics in this game are sheer witchcraft. There is no other explanation. The exploration doesn't hit quite as well as its predecessor, a necessary evil as we're exploring the same place, but the addition of the sky islands and especially the depths help keep things interesting. It has been a long time since a game has unnerved me as much as Tears of the Kingdom the first time I fell into a chasm and began to explore that vast darkness. Tears of the Kingdom also marks the series' first foray into telling a main story. I have a Zelda lore video in the pipeline, so I may retract this later, but in my experience, most Zelda titles are light on the main story. You start with some exposition, get some MacGuffins to chase, there's a twist, and then you chase more MacGuffins. In Ocarina of Time, for example, you have your prophetic dream and then have to chase down the sacred stones. When you gather them all and open the gate to the sacred realm, oops, that's what the villain wanted you to do. Now you have to gather the sages and put an end to them once and for all-ish. And the simple frame works because of the smaller scale stories you come across during your journey. People living their life, people that you want to save. The Zelda games are very good at setting up some vague lore and endearing you to the people who live in their world, and I think that plays a huge part in why Breath of the Wild did so well. The main plot has you wake up, learn how to play the game, and then you're called to defeat the final boss immediately. Everything other than going to Hyrule Castle to beat the game is optional. This allows all the writing to be those localized stories that the series has always excelled at, creating a Hyrule that is hard not to care about as you see so many civilizations persevering in the face of the apocalypse. Tears of the Kingdom leans into another quirk of Zelda writing, ignoring all previous canon. Zelda games are all thematically and aesthetically linked, but outside of the occasional easter egg and the rare direct sequel, the worlds and stories are not linked in any tangible way. This is what makes Zelda lore videos so fun, at least to me. There are no answers, so there is a lot of freedom in the stories you can find and tell. The problem you may have noticed is that Tears of the Kingdom is, at least ostensibly, a direct sequel to Breath of the Wild. But because everything in Breath of the Wild is optional, the only thing Tears of the Kingdom feels comfortable assuming is that you defeated Calamity Ganon. This creates a world that has forgotten you. All the hours spent in Breath of the Wild exploring every nook and cranny of Hyrule and helping every NPC you come across is wiped from existence. Not even your house belongs to you anymore. The world views it as Zelda's. Great for shippers, mind you, but still. Link may as well have sprung into existence atop the tutorial Sky Island for all his presence has affected the world below. All of the Sheikah technology is gone as well, vanished into the ether in a great mystery that no one really cares about, not enough even to mention in passing. And after all this, the main story is just, you know, it's fine. There are some incredible twists, there usually are. I can't get over the secret stone 
as a thing that exists. The name is quite bad to hear in dialogue, and the concept stumbles against the series staple, the Triforce, a thing which is ultimately fine to do, but as someone subjected to the relentless flow of time, it will take a few more games to get used to it, assuming they even want to keep secret stones in the series. The heart of these games have always been the gameplay, though, and Tears of the Kingdom is an absolute joy to play. For number next, we have Arcadian Atlas, the latest in the long line of games chasing Final Fantasy Tactics Shadow. I find it a worthy pursuit, and I'd be lying if I said that didn't have a significant impact on this game making the list. On its own, Arcadian Atlas is fine, the kind of game where you go, ah, that makes sense, when you hear it's the studio's first published title, or when you learn that the studio has, I believe, just four people in it. There are a lot of good ideas in this game. We have distinct classes that even have specialization options, a story that pits our main characters against each other on opposite sides of a war. Great for exploring the motivations of both sides rather than a good versus evil kind of deal. And a small deployment number for each map, which should help you feel like you're a small group against the world and help develop it with balancing. Each of these falls short of being great, though. There's not much build variety even with the specializations, and there's no interplay between the different jobs. You can equip a sub-job, and mastery over two jobs will not unlock a secret third job. The story seems alright, but I fell off at about the halfway point, and I haven't felt a particular desire to pick it back up. And with the small number of units you could deploy on any map, every fight began to feel the same. Despite all that, I do still genuinely like the game, even if I might not ever finish it. Because I, too, am always chasing Final Fantasy Tactics. Coming in at number 8, Wandering Sword, a martial arts RPG. In my free time, I read a lot on webtoons and a couple other apps and sites, but primarily webtoons. And the martial arts genre is one that I've grown quite fond of. I think the shared setting helps a lot. It's interesting to see how different stories interpret genre staples. There are also a lot of stories to tell within the space, and the setting is always ready for a great action scene. All good things. Wandering Sword does a fantastic job of telling one of those stories, and as a game, you get to take part of the action in a fun turn-based grid combat. My name for turn-based combat that features a minor movement component, but not enough to be a full SRPG. There's also just so much to do in the game. As good and dramatic as the main quest is, what really sold me on the game was walking into a town talking to everyone and coming away with a whole new to-do list, since the hero is chronically unable to not help people. I don't want to go too deep into this game, because I imagine it's one you might not be too familiar with, and I don't want to spoil it if this convinces you to give it a shot. For number 7, we have another game that I haven't beaten yet, but unlike Arcadian Atlas, I do feel an increasingly strong desire to jump back into Sea of Stars. It released around the same time as a couple other major titles, so it's impressive enough that it's stuck in memory. There are two pieces of the game that caused that. First, the reason I stopped playing is something that's entirely on me. The game gives you relics that can change how you play, and the first couple they give you are for accessibility, allowing you to enjoy the story no matter your familiarity with the genre. The problem is that one of those relics will heal your party back to full after every fight. On its own, this is fine and good, actually. I'm not keen on that kind of gameplay that has you prepare for a long adventure and becomes an endurance trial of how many of these easy enough fights can you get through before your supplies runs out? And can you beat the boss at the end of the gauntlet? I'll play it, and maybe sometimes I'll even enjoy it, but if I can avoid it, I'll do my best. For example, I'll clear out a zone once in a Souls game, and after proving I can do it, I'll just run through every subsequent time I need to. Sea of Stars seems very much balanced around that gauntlet. A dungeon has two major challenges. Can you get to the boss, and can you beat the boss? 
in the dungeons I've gotten through, there's a campfire right before the boss fight where you can make food, heal up, and prepare for the coming challenge. With the relic, half of that challenge is gone, and that's entirely on me. There is no slander against Sea of Stars here. Just a warning that the game is actually not balanced around going into every fight at full fighting power. The second thing that stuck with me is how incredibly imaginative the world is. A lot of fantasy worlds ultimately end up feeling like medieval Europe plus magic, and there are good reasons for doing that. The more alien a place is, the harder it can be to relate. So if you're trying to ground your players, a down-to-earth setting is a good way to go about that. Zemuria in the Trail series is a really good example of that. The first game in an arc will set a very realistic stage. The very first game is explicitly about getting to know the Kingdom of Liberal. And then, once the player is thoroughly invested, the second game can go wild with the more fantastical elements of the story. Sea of Stars completely skips the first part of that formula, throwing you straight into a world that is strange and awe-inspiring. And that has stuck with me despite only putting 7 hours into this game before getting distracted by other titles on this list. At number next we have Octopath Traveler 2. I played this game close to release, so it's been the better part of a year since I played it. And despite my memory being about as watertight as a sieve, I still remember the emotions that Partitio's story specifically left me with and the awe I felt at challenging the super boss. I desperately want an Octopath 3 that takes place in a near future where Partitio is trying to realize his dream. That was the prevailing thought I had when I rolled credits and before refreshing my memory, it was the driving force for making this list. Octopath Traveler 2 tells eight great stories, and unlike its predecessor, makes some effort to combine them. More work could be done, of course, but the game does a fantastic job of making it feel like a group of people working together to help each other, rather than eight disconnected stories that, uh, where only one person really exists and everyone else is just there for combat. The side quests in the game are also implemented in an absolutely stellar way. Someone will lament the problem and you have to actually pay attention to figure out what to do to resolve their woes. There's this the one side quest marker for a guy in a house and he's like, hey, get me this thing. So you do and he tosses you one single coin and the side quest marker stays. You can go broke running this quest over and over again because the way to resolve it is to find another guy in another town grumbling about his son and you have to bring that guy to the first guy for him to get his act together and resolve the quest. I love it. The combat refines what we see in the first game, which was good then and it's even better now. If you like this kind of game but you missed Octopath 2 or decided to sit it out because it one didn't quite hit, I fully recommend checking it out. At number derf we have Lies of P, a terrible name for an incredible game. It is easy to look at Lies of P and call it Pinocchio Bloodborne, and that definitely gets the vibe across. But I think it does the game a disservice to think of it as a Bloodborne clone. While it does a lot of the Soulsborne stuff you'd expect from a game within the genre, it, one, does them really, really well and two, does add its own unique flair in the separation of handles and blades. The blade of your weapon determines the type and how much you deal of your damage, and the handle controls your moveset and what stat the weapon scales with. As long as you're not too concerned about optimization, different blades are more compatible with different movesets, specifically with if it's better at stabbing or slashing. Uh, there's a lot of freedom in how you play. The action is quick, and just as you start to get used to an enemy type, the game throws a new one at you. I'm not, like, at all familiar with the story of Pinocchio. I'm confident I've seen the Disney film at least once, but I do not remember any of it. So, all of my familiarity comes from Kingdom Hearts 1's Monsters World and Franks' Paradise and Dream Drop Distance. Uh, even without any familiarity with the source material, I quite enjoyed what Liza P. had to tell and even had genuine chills when I viewed the real boy ending. The sequel slash DLC bait at the end was fun, teasing another story I don't really know, but I'm excited to see what they make next. 
Our next entry is Chance of Sonar, a game which, much to its detriment, reminds me of Grotto. I'll have more to say about that in the coming months, but for now, Chance of Sonar is a lovely puzzle game about ascending the Tower of Babel. At the start of the game, you are unable to communicate with anyone, but you learn the language of the many peoples who have made the tower their home, and acting as a translator, help to reconnect these isolated civilizations. It's a great game, especially as a fan of linguistics. A quick aside before we get to the last few entries here, I'm sure you've heard it, uh, but I've been writing the script over the course of the month with the expectation of recording and editing on the 30th for release on the 31st. Now, on the 29th, I'm working on wrapping the script up, which is mostly on schedule, but I'm coming out of having been rather sick, which may explain the coming entries not getting the attention they deserve, and also why I still haven't beaten two of them. And my voice. <laughs> Again, which I'm sure you've noted. Coming in at number four is Slay the Princess, an incredible visual novel which, like it tells you up front, is a very good love story. It's quite difficult to talk about all of the themes and elements that make this shine without spoiling a major plot point, and I don't want to do that. So instead, I will say that I got all 97 achievements in this game and still wanted more. Topping off the top three is Final Fantasy XVI, one of the aforementioned games that I haven't actually beaten. Something which is fine for a 10 through 6 entry, but certainly not for top three. I've heard that 16 loses its plot somewhere along the way. I think I'm about two-thirds of the way through the story, but I haven't seen that point yet, which means either it's been exaggerated or I just haven't hit it yet, and it could go either way. This game makes me want to try Devil May Cry. The combat is so fun and reactive. Some may pine for the days of turn-based Final Fantasy titles, but honestly, I don't mind so much. A game should have the gameplay that best fits it, and I think 16's gameplay fits Clive's story quite well. Also, that fight against Lost Titan, just incredible. At this point in the list, you might be thinking number two is going to be Baldur's Gate 3 or Armored Core 6, and you'd be right. Both of those titles are tied for second. Baldur's Gate 3 won Game of the Year, and well-deserved, too. The game is enormous, but every action still feels important, and they got the D&D gameplay down to a staggering degree. Armored Core 6 is my first game in that series, and I do now have to go play all the others. The game is so fun. I hit the Baltaeus wall, and who oh boy, is that a rough wall. But it helped me realize that this isn't a Souls game, it's Armored Core, and changing your build is not only allowed, but expected. It's very easy to change your build, and you can even save the good ones as presets to re-equip as needed. That said, while it wasn't Zimmerman's, I did find a build that ate through most everything. It had dual of the stun javelins from the worm fight, and I think double gatling guns. It got me through two and a half playthroughs. Before we finish out this year with number one, let's go back to last year, Glorious 2022, a simpler time where there were only nine top ten games of the year. I found the tenth of that list, and it comes in at number one. Released December 8th, it's Chained Echoes. Were I running things like Jeff Keighley, this would be number one on this list, but my lists demand an original release year to match the year the list comes out, so here we are. When I make a list of the best games of this decade, I have every confidence that Chained Echoes will make that list. While I don't have my top 10 games of all time ironed out, I believe that it makes the cut. Chained Echoes is how you remember Final Fantasy IV to be. It is the reason I had a rough first experience with Sea of Stars. The most brilliant thing, in my opinion, that the game does is make every fight exciting. Rather than go for the tried and true endurance gauntlet followed by boss route, Chained Echoes has you go into every fight at full health, so every fight can be stressful and exciting. I stopped interacting with those flowers in the first zone because they kept killing me. And that's fine, because levels are gained by milestones rather than experience. 
fighting random enemies will net you SP that you can use to power up skills, but levels are gained from grimoire shards, most often gotten from a boss fight. Every fight also has you juggling the heat bar, which when managed well keeps you safe and hitting hard, but if, like me, you forget and allow it to overheat, even random enemies can take you out. I think this is the first turn-based game where I thoroughly enjoyed combat all the way through the game. Turn-based combat, again, for me, usually goes like this. I'll spend a bit of time learning the system. How long this takes depends on how front-loaded the story is. Then once I've got the hang of it, I'll spend a good chunk of the game getting better at it until I hit a point where I feel that I've mastered it. And after that, I'll still enjoy the systems that go into it, but I will no longer enjoy the actual combat. I never hit a point where I no longer enjoyed combat while 100%ing Chained Echoes. And at long last, we have this year's number one entry. It's Vernal Edge, the other game I haven't beaten yet. For any list like this, the top three are usually interchangeable, and I will fully admit that Vernal Edge likely has this venerated spot for less than admirable reasons. Don't get me wrong, it's a top three game for sure. Probably, I haven't beaten it yet. But I am, at the core of my being, a hater. Any of the other top three contenders would be expected to land at number one, so of course none of them can. Vernal Edge is a metroidvania that takes place on a floating archipelago. The world map has this adorable PS1 aesthetic, and I rather like the aggressive healing method. Rather than potions you chug during a safe moment, you mark an enemy and then use a life-draining attack on them. It's difficult and usually unforgiving, but it keeps the combat fast-paced and engaging. Exploration is fun, and the environments have been interesting and varied. There's still time for things to turn south, but currently Vernal Edge stands as my game of the year. And that's our list, all 13 entries for 2023's Top 10 Games of the Year. A great year for games, a bad year to work in games. I wanted to go on a bit more about this, but again, I am pushing the deadline and also sick. Every list I've seen this year has addressed the absolutely awful state of the industry, so hopefully you don't need me to say much. What I will say is that even if we go back to years where I do not find 10 games to fill out my top 10 games list, because game development has moved to longer timelines with a concerted effort to avoid crunch, I genuinely hope we begin to appreciate the people who make games and that the industry treats them with the respect that they deserve. I have been Atticus, and thank you for participating.